Welcome to Student Organization Risk Management Training, brought to you by the UNT Student Activity Center. In 2007, the 80th Texas Legislature added Section 51.9361 to the Education Code regarding risk management training of officers and advisors of student organizations. It requires the university cover eight different topics related to risk management. It requires advisors to attend risk management training once and specified officers to attend annually. And it requires these officers and advisors to report on the training's content at a meeting of the full membership of the organization or club. As a result, you might want to take some notes and ask follow-up questions if you need clarity. In order to ensure UNT is in compliance with the law, you will be asked to take a quiz at the end of this training. You will need to pass with a score of at least 70% to earn credit for your participation. As previously mentioned, we are required to cover eight topics, which include alcoholic beverages and illegal drugs, hazing, sexual abuse and harassment, fire and other safety issues, travel, behavior at events, adoption of a risk management policy, and issues regarding persons with disabilities. Hello, Mindy. I love that stuff. Been drinking it for years. You know, I, I heard they recently decided to add more hops to it. The first topic is possession and use of alcoholic beverages and illegal drugs, including penalties that may be imposed for possession or use. Hopefully you know that Texas law states that one must be 21 or over to possess or drink alcohol. As you also probably know, being at a university with a mixture of students above and below legal drinking age causes problems for students and student organizations when underage students decide to drink. As a result, UNT has created specific policies for drinking on campus. Therefore, a student and student organization is not only subject to criminal and or civil proceedings regarding violations of the law regarding both alcohol and illegal drugs, but also university proceedings through the Dean of Students. So if a student or advisor is found in violation of the law, he or she could face a number of sanctions from community service to jail time. And if found in violation of the Code of Student Conduct, a student could face sanctions ranging from a warning through expulsion from UNT. University policy prohibits the unlawful possession, use, or distribution of alcohol and illegal drugs on all university property and as part of any official university activity except as expressly permitted by law and university policy or regulation. Exceptions would include things like official tailgating and at events with appropriate permission. Student organizations desiring to sell, serve, or consume any type of alcoholic beverage on campus must obtain permission at least 10 business days in advance via the alcohol use request form, with the exception of the Union, Gateway Center, and Apogee, all three of which arrange presence of alcohol and distribution. If an organization desires to have alcohol at an on-campus event, please refer to policy 10.14, Use of Alcoholic Beverages, for more info. The seniors, we tried. We, we, we gave you all a chance. But we're just going to have to try something else, won't we? Seniors, you love us. Smile. You love us. The second topic is hazing. As defined in state law and by UNT policy, hazing means any intentional, knowing, or reckless act occurring on or off campus of an educational institution by one person alone or acting with others directed against a student that endangers the mental or physical health or safety of a student for the purpose of pledging, being initiated into, affiliating with, holding office in, or maintaining membership in an organization. The term includes any type of physical brutality such as whipping, beating, striking, branding, electronic shocking, placing of harmful substance on the body, or similar activity. All right, freshmen, I'll tell you what, just for being such brave little kids, I'm only going to give each of you five licks, okay? <laughs> All right, grab a pole then, kid. Let's get going. Any type of physical activity such as sleep deprivation, exposure to the elements, confinement in a small space, calisthenics, 
or other activity that subjects the student to an unreasonable risk of harm or that adversely affects the mental or physical health or safety of the student. Any activity involving consumption of a food, liquid, alcoholic beverage, liquor, drug, or other substance that subjects the student to an unreasonable risk of harm or that adversely affects the mental or physical health or safety of the student. Any activity that intimidates or threatens the student with ostracism that subjects the student to extreme mental stress, shame, or humiliation that adversely affects the mental health or dignity of the student or discourages the student from entering or remaining registered in an educational institution or that may reasonably be expected to cause a student to leave the organization of the institution rather than submit these activities. And any activity that induces, causes, or requires the student to perform a duty or task that involves a violation of the state penal code. Keep in mind that a student's willingness to participate in any of these activities does not mean that an activity is not considered hazing, nor is it a defense to any charges of violating UNT policy or state law. So just because a student doesn't mind or wants to participate in the activity, if it meets any of the previously stated criteria, it's still hazing. Hazing is not only a violation of code, but also a violation of state law. A student or advisor violates this policy and state law if he or she engages in hazing, solicits, encourages, directs, aids, or attempts to aid another in engaging in hazing, recklessly permits hazing to occur, or has first-hand knowledge of the planning of a specific hazing incident involving a student at UNT, or has first-hand knowledge that a specific hazing incident has occurred, and knowingly fails to report that knowledge in writing to the Dean of Students or other appropriate university official. So even if you don't engage in the hazing itself, as an officer or advisor, if you know about it or allow it to happen, you are in fact violating university policy and state law. A student could be expelled from UNT for being found in violation of hazing, and a person is also subject to civil and criminal sanctions for violating state law. Offense of failing to report is a Class B misdemeanor. A violation that does not cause serious bodily injury to another is a Class B misdemeanor. Any other offense that causes serious bodily injury to another is a Class A misdemeanor. Any offense that causes the death of another is a state jail felony. Depending on the severity of the case, all of these criminal sanctions would include a fine and or jail time. In addition, an organization violates this policy and state law if it condones or encourages hazing, or if an officer or any combination of members, pledges, or alumni of the organization commits or assists in the commission of hazing. An organization could be suspended from UNT for being found in violation of hazing and is also subject to civil and criminal sanctions for violating state law, which include a misdemeanor offense punishable by a fine of $5,000 to $10,000 if the court finds that the offense caused personal injury, property damage, or other loss of at least $5,000 to or up to double the amount lost or expenses incurred because of the injury, damage, or loss. The university may grant immunity from university-imposed sanctions for a violation of this policy to each student who voluntarily testifies against an individual who or organization that violates this policy. Any person who reports a specific hazing incident involving a student to the Dean of Students or other appropriate official of the university is immune from university-imposed sanctions that might otherwise be incurred or imposed. The same goes with criminal prosecution. A person will be granted immunity from prosecution for reporting it. For help regarding hazing, please see resources on the UNT Dean of Students website. Contact Student Activities and or the UNT Hazing Hotline, 940-369-STOP. Water. Yep. All right. See if this thing's working. Oh! Oh, my God! Oh! I'm sorry. Oh, you know what? Ah! Oh, I think I... And make out our little friend right there. Stop it. Ooh, Shabbat Shalom. Somebody circumcised. Okay. <laughs> the third topic is sexual abuse and harassment. It is a violation of the code to engage in acts of sexual misconduct, sexual abuse, sexual harassment, sexual exploitation, sexual violence, or sexual coercion as defined by state, international and federal law, and university policy. Sexual harassment is defined in the code as unwelcome conduct of sexual nature including but not limited to unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, sexual violence, and other verbal, nonverbal, or physical conduct or sexual nature. What do you do if you need help? If it is not related to employment status, students should report harassment violations to the Dean of Students. UNT employees should contact Human Resources. 
If you or anyone in your organization becomes a victim of sexual assault, abuse, or violence, notify the police immediately and go to the hospital for an examination. Victims may choose to have someone to take them to the hospital or a police officer can meet them at their location to provide transportation. The police officer will need to obtain a statement describing the details of the assault. A counselor from the Denton County or Dallas Rape Crisis Centers will be contacted to meet with victims at the hospital. The counselor will talk with victims and inform them of their options involving counseling. The fourth topic is fire and other safety issues, including the possession and use of a firearm or other weapon of an explosive device. This is a combination of a number of policies all in one section related to safety issues. University policy requires students and student organizations to follow fire and safety code within buildings, which means enforcing a fire capacity within rooms, for example, for meetings or events. Before you have a meeting or event, know the capacity of the room and don't let in more people than the maximum. University policy now prohibits camping on university property, with a few exceptions, like tailgating. For more info, see policy 18.1.24. Texas Senate Bill 11, 2015, also known as Campus Carry, allows the possession of concealed handguns on campus by individuals who are licensed to carry. This applies to all faculty, staff, students, guests, visitors, individuals, and organizations doing business on behalf of the university on the campus premises. However, this does not apply to commissioned peace officers. When planning events, there are some activities and locations on campus where handguns are prohibited. Activities and locations that are of prudence to student organizations are as follows. Where a sporting event is taking place on campus, including intercollegiate, sports club, and intramural competitions at the Physical Education Building, Ken Bonson Gymnasium Building, Pole Recreation Center, and all intramural athletic fields. Where large-scale events happen, such as the Union and Gateway Ballrooms, Union Lyceum, Coliseum, Art TVF Theater, Main Auditorium, Murchison Performing Arts Center, and Vortman Concert Hall. Where student services occur on campus, including Goldsby Chapel, the Union Meditation Room, and any place that a religious service is taking place. This list does not include all activities and locations prohibited, just those that are most likely to impact student organizations. To see the full list, visit campuscarry.unt.edu. When an organizational activity meets the criteria for prohibiting concealed carry, signage must be posted in compliance with the Texas statute in the areas where concealed handguns are prohibited. However, it is in the organization's best interest to inform attendees in advance that concealed handguns are prohibited in these locations. For more information, contact Officer Kevin Crawford with the UNT Police Department at kevin.crawford at unt.edu or refer to campuscarry.unt.edu. It is a violation of the code to have unauthorized use or possession of ammunition, explosives, or other objects that are dangerous or flammable or that could cause damage by fire or explosion to persons or property. It is also a violation of the code to tamper with or misuse security or safety equipment, like fire alarms. Seatbelts, everyone! Please let this be a normal field trip with a friend. No way! Cruising on down Main Street, you're relaxed and feeling good. Next thing that you know, you'll see it. <laughs> the fifth topic is travel to a destination outside which the area of the institution is located. If your student organization is traveling, you must follow University Policy 18.4.5 Student Travel Policy, which is mandated by state law. The policy applies to activities or events that are located more than 25 miles from campus, and when travel is required by the student organization or funded by and requires use of a vehicle owned or leased by the university. The policy discusses different safety precautions for different modes of travel, car, plane, etc., including among others, common sense, following the law, for example, wearing seatbelts, 
maintaining van capacity at 10 individuals, and upholding sleep requirements and mileage per day limits. If the travel meets the criteria of the policy, an organization must obtain written approval for the travel from its UNT faculty staff advisor or the department head responsible for funding or organizing the travel before the date of the event or activity. The sixth topic is behavior at parties and other events held by a student organization. Much of this topic is indirectly covered in previous sections, alcohol, sexual abuse, hazing, etc. If a student organization is holding an event, which is generally anything more than a meeting of members, on campus, it must submit an event application at least 15 business days prior to the event if the event is considered at least a little risky to people or facilities, which may include expecting more than 100 people in attendance, serving food and or beverages, selling tickets for admission, inviting off-campus guests, handling hazardous materials like fire, a sledgehammer, etc., serving alcohol, involves any kind of physical activity like dancing, flag football, basketball tournaments, etc., or inviting minors. The decision about whether an event is a little risky is at the discretion of the university, not the student organization. So if there is any doubt about whether this deadline is applicable to an organization's event, err on the side of caution and submit it by the 15 business day deadline. Some of these event applications will be sent to the Event Safety Committee, or ESC, for review. When that happens, the organization will need to attend an ESC meeting. The purpose of the ESC is to ensure that all organization events with possible risks associated with them are executed in the safest way possible. In the meeting, the ESC will determine stipulations that the organization will need to comply with in order to hold the event, which could include things like hiring police or purchasing event insurance. According to state law, organizations should adopt a risk management policy or plan. If you are part of a Greek social organization, you likely already have one. If not, you should create one. This should include standards to guide the organization in reducing risks at community service activities, socials, when traveling, or any other activity that your specific organization is likely to encounter. For example, say your organization is hosting a skit night open to anyone. Part of the risk management policy would be to identify risks that could occur for each activity of the event. In this case, for example, there is an injury on stage or even in the audience. Identify ways to reduce the identified risks and prevent potentially harmful things from happening. In this case, the organization would want to check equipment prior to use and make sure electrical cords are taped down so that people won't trip over them. Create a plan for what to do if something harmful does happen. In this case, plan ahead and have information on the nearest hospital, train event staff on the location of facility exits, and have a first aid kit at the event. 118. All right, fine, fine, I'm 127. Uh-huh, and it says here you were born in 1964, but that's not true either, is it? Is it? No. Can you tell me what it says here on your birth certificate under date of birth? Your Honor, I object. What does this have to do with anything? Overruled. Mrs. Cole, answer the question. 1965. Now, let me get this straight. That would mean that you lied about your age to make yourself older. But why would any woman want to do that? I changed it so I could get married. And the truth shall set you free! As you probably know, we live in a society that loves to sue, and unfortunately, if something bad happens, the person is likely to sue the organization, officers of the organization, and possibly others. In a court of law, if you can show that you made an effort to reduce risks and followed protocol listed within your plan, your personal and organizational liability will be decreased. If you have a national affiliation, the national organization should be able to help you create a risk management plan. If not, student activities can help. In the near future, organizations will be required to submit their plans to ensure compliance. State and federal law, Americans with Disabilities Act of 2008, as amended, and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, mandate equal access for persons with disabilities. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in programs and activities, both public and private, that receive federal financial assistance. By policy 10.15 University Policy Statement on Diversity, UNT does not unlawfully discriminate on the basis of disability in its educational programs and activities. 
UNT receives federal funds, the university must ensure that the university community, including student organizations, avoids discrimination and provides equal access in its activities. It is therefore the organization's duty to make sure an accommodation is provided if it is needed. So if a student with a disability wants to join your organization or attend an event or activity of your organization, the organization needs to ensure it is accessible. For example, for a student with a hearing impairment, it may be necessary to provide that student with a sign language interpreter at the organization's event. UNT Policy 18.1.14, Disability Accommodation Policy for Students and Academic Units, clarifies that students with disabilities should register with the Office of Disability Accommodation to verify the disability and thus be eligible to request an accommodation. The vast majority of accommodation requests are simple and inexpensive, and there are resources on campus to help you with these. Accommodation issues can become serious complaints or even lawsuits, so if your organization receives a request for accommodation, talk to Student Activities or the Office of Disability Accommodation for help, which may include helping the organization explore ways to fund accommodations. The Office of Disability Accommodation is located in Sage Hall 167 and online at disability.unt.edu. Finally, if you'd like to learn more about the subject, please visit the Student Organization Resources page on the Student Activities webpage. As has been alluded to, code applies to students and student organizations. A student group will be responsible for the actions and conduct of its members when one or more of its members, acting in the capacity of their membership, commit a violation of the code. Student groups found in violation of the code will be subject to disciplinary procedures and sanctions in the same manner as individual students, except that student groups cannot be permanently removed from the university. For organizations, sanctions vary from warning to loss of registered status or ability to have socials to suspension. For students, sanctions include a warning to expulsion. The code applies to conduct that occurs on university premises, at university activities, and also to conduct that may occur off campus that could adversely affect the university community and or pursuit of the university's educational mission or that could create a hostile environment for a student on campus. In a nutshell, this means that you represent UNT and your organization wherever you are. If you have questions about any of the material in this presentation, contact Student Activities in Union 345 at 940-565-3807 or at student.activities at unt.edu. Quiz time! As mentioned at the beginning of training, you will need to complete a quiz in order to ensure UNT is in compliance with the law. You will need to pass with a score of at least 70% to earn credit for your participation. You will be notified of your score via email. Please go to the website to take the quiz. Thank you for your time.